So do we do we have to wait a few seconds before it actually goes onto YouTube or? We all need to. <laughs> okay. So uh, <laughs> welcome everybody. Um, and um, very nice to welcome all our guests here for this event, a uh, conversation about anti-racist art in the UK and uh, in Latin America. Um, so this event comes out of, or is linked to a project called Cultures of Anti-Racism in Latin America. Um, hold on, let me just do something here, which is to mute that. Um, and um, the project is, is financed by the um, Arts and Humanities Research Council of the UK, and <clears throat> it involves a project looking at the way that artists in um, Brazil, Colombia and Argentina use their artistic creative practice to talk about issues around diversity uh, and especially racism and how they use their artistic practice to challenge racism specifically. Um, this particular event is funded by the ESRC's Festival of Social Science, so thanks to them. And in this discussion, we want to have, um, try and create a dialogue between artists working in the British context and artists working in uh, Colombia and, and Brazil, so the Latin American context, and try and bring out some of the, the differences that those regional contexts make to the way that artists work in relation to um, racism and diversity, and also the institution, the institutional structures of uh, artistic practice in their countries. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank each artist for their, their for agreeing to do this, and uh, I won't say I'm not going to present the artists because I'm going to give them a, a few minutes each to present themselves and their work in, in just a second. Um, so just to say who I am, I'm Peter Wade. Uh, I work for the University of Manchester. I'm the director of the project <coughs> Carla, which is Cultures of Anti-Racism in Latin America. Also with me in the room here is uh, Jamile Pinedo Diaz who is one of the uh, postdoctoral research associates on the project. We have three of them all together. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're, although I'd like to especially thank uh, Diana and Liliana for agreeing to speak in English, which is obviously not uh, their native language. So that's um, uh, an effort that they have to make. I appreciate the additional effort that that, that takes. So people who obviously, uh, people who are speaking in English, Equa, Suandi, if you could speak slowly, I think that would be that would be useful. Um, and if people are going to chip in with questions later on, then we should all speak slowly. If you have any problems understanding, Diara Jamili will help you. Liliana, I can help you uh, if there's any translation that needs doing. Um, so we are live on YouTube. Um, everybody who's watching on YouTube can ask questions in the chat in the comment section of YouTube, and we will uh, address those questions. Uh, at the end. So what the way it's going to work is that I will give each of these uh, of our guests um, a few minutes to present themselves, what they're about, just say a few words about their work and their background, their trajectory and so on. And then I'm going to um, open a discussion asking them to respond to specific questions that I hope will draw out some of the differences and similarities that exist uh, across these different regional contexts and perhaps what uh, people in one uh, working in one regional context can learn from from the others and so forth um, and then I'll, we'll see how, how far that takes us and there should be a space at the end for us to address questions that the public can pose uh, via the chat on YouTube so let's start with the uh, the self presentations of the artists um, Equa, do you want to start I'll give you three, four minutes, maximum five minutes, please. Sure. Wow. Um, okay. I w had no idea of an order and I really like to respond to what I hear. So going first. Um, I really thought about this in terms of a short period of time to talk about my practice. Um, and I'm 60 next year and I feel like I've been an artist my whole life. So it's quite a long period of time. So I thought maybe I'd just talk about the last year. This, this year has been... Um, obviously for everyone uh, and I think one of the most important things that is I want to talk about is how artists as human 
uh, and, and members of our communities because quite often I feel that we are separated from our communities and only discussed as a sort of tool and a vehicle and I and I want to acknowledge um, our humanness and how that how that what that means in terms of the pandemic um, both in terms of the impact of the disease itself the exposing of the sort of historical inequalities in terms of health education and the sort of the brutality of uh, the justice system um, that's the sort of first part of call in terms of where I am um, I have a traditional root in terms of a, a sort of white established arts practice I went to art school I went when I was young when I was 16 um, fell out of it and fell back in when I was 19 I'm still still young too young I think uh, I went to um, a number of arts institutions. The last, well, I went to a couple while I was developing where I wanted to go. And then I went to St. Martin's School of Art and studied sculpture and um, sort of ran from there to what was um, Hornsey and became Middlesex Folly. In fact, every educational establishment I've ever attended has a different name. There's something very sort of weird and, and unsticky about that. Um, and the reason I raise that is I think it it does, on one hand, it impacts um, positively, and on the other hand, it impacts really negatively in terms of how I've journeyed through the world as a black woman um, and how I feel about institutions and organisations and how, you know, how that's impacted, because it was not a happy time being in art education, uh, particularly in the early 80s, as a woman anyway, um, but as a black woman, it was a very isolating and um, very disengaging. So that is where I came through. And then I became very much an, an artist in the community, using my arts practice in the, the in communities that were the most impacted by um, a sort of advanced capitalist country. So those who were impacted economically, uh, culturally, um, uh, predominantly those two factors um, and I spent most of my working life working with the arts with artists my I'm a practitioner myself but also moving on to try and support other artists to bring art as a liberating empowering tool into the lives of people across the, uh, the UK so north to south east to west across the UK and always in the most disadvantaged communities so uh, about 10 years ago, I decided, I knew, well, I didn't, did I decide? I, could, I, I needed to actually go back to looking at my own practice as an artist. And at that point, um, I had worked in theatre as a project manager. I'd been a producer and I had been, I became finally the chief exec of an institution. And this is someone who's very unhappy in institutions. And I was the chief exec of the New Art Exchange, the first chief exec of World of the New Art Exchange in Nottingham. And then 10 years ago, I have to be an artist. I have to honor the, 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 the talent, the skill, the ability I have, but also um, I, I couldn't sort of silence it anymore. It's like a, a journey. I had to find out what, that, what I had to offer as an artist rather than an artist manager and project manager. Now, 10 years on, what I am really interested in, and particularly this year has really helped me to look at, is that that thing that I thought I needed to do, which was to not be one and be another, is actually, I think, part of the battle that we're all in. Um, so now I regard myself as an artist. Ooh, am I on camera? I can't even see. Um, but I also regard myself as an activist. And I regard myself as these are all equally important there's no separation a grandmother and most recently and this is one of the hardest ones because we're really there's a real separation and this year has really got me thinking about it but also a politician and that is because i actually am participating within party politics which i've never done before and actually i'm running for a local government uh, official position i should have it sh i should have gone to election this year um, but i will go next year and this year has really, really, my practice is now looking at how then does there, not only does there not need to be, there cannot be a separation between those roles. I am one person and it is really essential that I manifest 
as one person. So it all runs. Imagine it, one long word that I've just shown you in English. Uh, and hopefully that was not too quick. It probably was a bit quick. Um, and how what I produce is a constant, I guess. So, I mean, I'm learning how to be that artist, activist, grandmother, politician, let's be honest. Um, so sometimes that's about just practicing. So I sit in a lot of Zoom meetings, I'm sure we all do. And it's wonderful. This one is the most one of the most exciting because of where you are and you are who you are. And, and most of the time I want to stop talking actually. So Peter, I can't wait till you signal for me to stop talking because yeah. I want to listen <laughs> that's fine. and I want to see people. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm constant. So this notebook that I just showed you is actually just full of drawings and each one of them is dedicated to a meeting I sit in. I sit in Greater Manchester Tenants Union. I'm a member of the Labour Party. Um, I'm engaged in all sorts of activist work and I, what I'm trying to do now is to be an artist, a very present as an artist in all of them. But traditionally I'm, I have a sculpture background, I have a live art background, I have a drag queen, which is quite new, and I have a filmmaking practice. Good. That's great. Thank you very much. As Audrey Lord said, we don't live single issue lives. Um, okay, Liliana, do you want to go next? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, well, I am uh, Liliana Angulo Cortez. I am from Colombia. I was born in Bogota. Uh, I have been living um in in bogota most of my life but in my practice as an artist i travel a lot uh, around the country um what can i say i i went to the national university in in bogota um and uh, since i was born in in bogota i had the privilege to go to a really good university to have a good education which is something that uh, in many regions in, regions in Colombia is not uh, easy, not common. Um, um, I, I graduated as a sculptor. Uh, so my main practice uh, has to do with uh, working with objects and space. And also I do uh, work a lot with my own body I do uh, performance and uh, many of my practice has to do with uh, issues of, um, yeah, with the body. I went uh, to the United States with a scholarship, uh, with a Fulbright, and I went to the University of Illinois in Chicago, which is also a public university. Um, and I did a master degree there. Uh, I also at some point studied anthropology, but I uh, didn't graduate. I stopped <laughs> my master, uh, but it, it was very important uh, for me to do that. Um, and, and also I have been working mainly with images. So I work with uh, kind of the history of art in Colombia, the colonial uh, representations, uh, most of my initial work was about stereotypes and how black people have been represented in, in Colombian art and also in images in general. Uh, but then uh, around, uh, I guess, 12 years ago, I started working uh, mostly with communities. So what I started doing was to work on performative practices like uh, braiding hair or dancing, uh, like uh, practices that are very um, dear for uh, black people in Colombia. Um, and because of that, I started uh, traveling and working uh, also with a lot of women organizations and kind of black organization in the organizations in the black movement in Colombia. Um, so in that sense, I start also kind of organizing and kind of using art practice to deal with issues in different communities and territories. Uh, recently, I, I have been working um, with a community in the south of Colombia, in Buenaventura, which is a, a port, the main port in Colombia. 
and uh, one of the leaders was killed. Uh, in Colombia, many leaders have been killed in during decades, but recently, after the peace process with the uh, one of the the longest guerrillas in history, uh, it, this issue has been growing, and um, people that is defending the territory uh, is in danger. And this leader was killed, and it all it kind of uh, it happened because he was defending the territory in an area that has big uh, macroeconomic projects of development for the port. So uh, we we work uh, on his archive. Uh, he had a archive practice uh, in order to defend the territory. Uh, so with the leaders and the community, we continue that work. And this year I have been working in an institution. I also have been, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, a public servant. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Uh, but yeah, I work for the city. I have been working in the cultural and art um, uh, sector in, in Bogota. Uh, and right now I am um, working with the Institute for the Arts in Bogota, which is kind of the institution that um, do, uh, over, I, I don't know how to say, um, does the um, public policy for the arts in, in Bogota and all the budgets and, and all that. So that's what I have been doing this year. Okay, thank you very much, Liliana. Um, Suandi, do you want to Go next, please. Yeah. I'm going to say, I'm, after I speak, I'm going to knit downstairs and get a support for my phone, otherwise I'm going to get cramp in my arms. So good afternoon, everybody. And lovely to meet sisters from so far away. Echo, of course, I know. Um, I didn't come to the arts in the normal way. I fell into the arts um, half of what the age Equa is now, but I'm not giving my age away. Um, I grew up wanting to be a teacher, but I actually trained as a dancer. I took ballet, tap, and what was then called modern music. And it was too early in society to have a black ballet dancer, so I wasn't going to go anywhere with that career. Coming into the arts was a flight of fancy to be honest and then I realized just what a powerful voice it was and in a way and I don't want Emery to think I am naive I also learned what institutional racism was even though we didn't call it that then so the arts for me have always been a battlefield but at the same time it's been a hugely wonderful supportive experience because I've been in Black Arts Alliance, now known as National Black Arts Alliance. So anything I've achieved, I've achieved in collaboration with that membership and with colleagues across the arts, not just in the UK, but um, in America, Brazil, Africa, different places I've worked. I'm a great believer that we don't uh, achieve anything on our own. We just keep going forward if we go forward collectively in a team. My main art form is poetry, performance work, but I, I don't know if you can translate the word dabble. So yeah, I can see heads nodding. Okay, so I dabble across the art. Um, I'll take up anything. I always say I've, I've written an opera. This is the best example. And when I was asked to write a libretto, I said yes. I didn't know what a libretto was. I couldn't look it up because I couldn't spell the word. But my motto has always been to say yes, consider whether I could do it. If I felt I'm going to make a fool of myself, then pull away. So my dabbling means I've stepped across the arts world. So I've worked with exhibitions. I've written narratives for exhibitions with public art. Kevin Johnson's Slave Memorial in Lancaster, I worked on that. And I give lots of um, lectures at conferences, things 
But that's, I think, sometimes about them wanting to have a token black voice. I'm not always sure they're happy. They did invite me to be that token black voice because I might not always speak in the manner that they want me to speak in. But I think every opportunity to speak should be taken and remember that when we do speak as individuals, we represent all black people, whether that's right or wrong. So we have to be careful and consider what we say and what we do. That's it, really. Good. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, and last but not least, Diana, would you like to tell us about yourself? Hello, everybody. First of all, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And my name is Dayara. I am a granddaughter from the Tucano Nation, that is an indigenous people in Brazil. We live in the border between Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela. Actually, my mother is Colombian and my grandmother as well. And um, well, I am today, I was put into this world also of being an artist. And we uh, and, and I'm making part of a full new generation of indigenous indigenous contemporary art. Uh, that's how they call it. <laughs> and, and well, I have a graduation in visual arts in the University of Brasilia and a post graduation in human rights in the same university. Uh, I have a research on the right to memory and truth of indigenous peoples. Uh, I am also a coordinator in an indigenous radio that is called Radio Yande. It's an online radio, you can reach it by the site, it's Yande with an Y. And, um, and in the last years I've been uh, plunging into the memories and the culture of my family, of my nation, and uh, uh, mostly through drawings and paintings and um, also discussing what is our relation to the art itself and um, and also being an activist I uh, as an independent communicator I follow the indigenous movement here in Brazil that is really strong and I put myself to the service to share the, the words of our indigenous leaders and um, the reality of indigenous peoples in Brazil. So uh, when we talk about racism, well, I believe we're talking about racism all the time because uh, we are facing racism all the time. We are facing the story and the narratives of colonization and trying to dismantle it a little bit with all the weapons that are and uh, all the technologies that we can and so uh, art is just one of those spaces that is also a space of um, a political dispute of power dispute and um, being present re reaffirming our indigenous identities is uh, an act of rebellion uh, in front of all the speech of colonization that claims uh to make us part of the past or death <laughs> and now we are alive we are here we are contemporary as everybody uh, we have a very powerful memory we are originary peoples we are defending our rights our territories uh, our epistemologies our, our way of um, approaching existence and defending our own truth so um, um, I am here in Sao Paulo, uh, where I am uh, being part of two important exhibitions. Uh, the first, uh, the first exhibition about indigenous contemporary art is open here in a very important museum in the city that is called the Pinacoteca, and that received like 42 indigenous artists from all over the country. And I am also having my first solo exhibition in the, center, in the cultural center of Sao Paulo. Uh, so it's a very big deal for us, especially during these pandemics. This week, I lost my grandfather with 110 years old. Uh, he was born in the 1910, <laughs> in 1910, and he lived the whole 20th century. He lived the arrival of the um, uh, missionary churches and the boarding schools. 
he endured the dictatorship times, he was part of the creation of indigenous movement, and now he is gone uh, with uh, this uh, pandemic of COVID-19 that has taken away a lot of very important indigenous leaders. And um, so uh, I am a granddaughter that is um, trying to keep on with the dreams of our grandfathers and grandmothers and not letting our culture die, defending it until the last um, drop of blood. <laughs> That's it. Good, okay, thank you all very much. That was all uh, very interesting, fascinating. Um, so now I want to sort of move on to the discussion part of the, of the event um, and what one of the, the reasons for bringing you all together is to try and draw out differences and similarities in the way that you as artists from Brazil, Colombia and the UK, through your creative practice um, and engagement with the world of art, address issues of racism and racialized difference as they exist in the context of your particular countries. And you know, you might want to, rather than just talking about Brazil and Colombia, you might want to think about Latin America as a whole or Europe as a whole because those regions, um, although they're linked very strongly by colonial and post-colonial histories, also have quite different histories of racial formation. So just as one example, um, in Colombia and Brazil, very large proportions of the population self-identify as mixed in some way. So in Brazil, 40% of people identify as, as in the census category called pardo, which means brown, more or less, it's kind of brown colored. Um, in Colombia, about 50% of the population identify as mestizo, which is a word meaning mixed or mixed race in some way. Um, so very large percentages of the population don't identify as either black or indigenous or white. Um, and they identify instead as in this kind of amorphous uh, and very malleable mixed race category. Whereas in the UK, as we know, um, nearly 90% of the population identifies as white in the census, and only 3% of the population identify spe specifically as mixed race, um, with black and Asian people being about 3 and 5%. So that means that when, as an artist, addressing a public in your country, you're talking to very, very different audiences. So, you know, Equa and Swandi, you're talking to an audience that's majority white. Whereas Diana and Liliana, you're talking to a, an audience that is as a large percentage of white people, but also a very large percentage of, of people who aren't identifying as white in some way, and they aren't identifying as black or indigenous either. So I wonder if you could each talk a bit about how you would tailor your artistic practice to the audience that exists in your country, bearing in mind that those kinds of differences um, and how you address issues around racism and anti-racism and coloniality and indeed, you know, patriarchy and uh, heteronormativity and so on, which one can never separate from these, these issues of, of race uh, in your work with particular attention to the, the national and regional context in which you're working. So who wants to start? Can I say oh, that at, oh, time, at some point? Oh, God, sorry, go on, yeah. Sorry. I just want to say not all, speaking personally, not all the art I make is made to tackle racism. Because as artists, we make art because we want to, because something inspires, and that's really important. And I, I didn't notice it when I first forwarded the flyer for the marketing of the event, how we all had black artists immediately after all our names. Um, and we're here, we're four black women here. I'm talking about the artists in this in instance. And I, I felt, when I read it again, I thought, we didn't need that. We stand out, we are black people, we're here, it's not anything, we, it's not something we can hide, we can't change that factor. So I thought it was quite interesting to see that. Speaking personally, how do I temper my work for a different audience? I'm not sure I do. I think I make my work and 
like anybody I hope it's received in the way I want it to be received and understood in that manner I can't give out the energy to a white audience that might be offended by it that is not my job you know if people want to take something away from it that's really good but I'm not going to defend my work to a white audience because I think we've been forced into a defensive position for far too long as a black community, I mean, that in the global sense of the word, that we do not have to apologize anymore. Okay, so if you, if you were addressing an audience in Britain, just to imagine a sort of different scenario where half the people in the room didn't identify as white, would, do you think that would make a difference to the way you addressed your audience or you talked about racism and and so on well let me turn it around when mm. i worked in brazil mm. uh, i found no difference i found a common voice be because of the history of colonialism more than anything else right my sorrow in brazil was that there weren't that many dark-skinned brazilians at the global forum the three times i was over there that's over a six-year period mm. uh, and we were imported as black people particularly and i'm nigerian but not from nigeria but you know nigerian heritage particularly what we call designer africans coming in the cloth and the head wrapped and people wanted to talk to them and i was looking around saying where are where are the, the artists from brazil in this status gathering um but with the artists I did meet, yes, there was definitely a common voice. Different experience on that journey, but it comes down to the big R each time. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. It's also interesting that in it just I said I guess that says something about the global forum in Brazil that there were mostly white white people there or white Brazilians anyway. Yeah. Not only just white people, but I, the first year because when the first time I went, I was the only people, person from sorry i'm talking too fast from the uk to go mm. i came wrote up everything shared it when i went back and we were in uh, sao paulo the second time and people who came from the uk i loved how they said to me oh sue andy how did you manage to get here <laughs> interesting um, anybody else want to chip in on, on that, this question of the audience and how you address a, an audience that's you know, very different? Yes. Um, I think in, in, in my case, I, I have been very intentional with kind of addressing a specific audience because I, since I started my career as, as an artist, like in the kind of the um, in in a city like Bogota, um, I was at some point kind of the only black person in the room normally, and also uh, one of the few artists that were uh, having exhibition during a long time. I didn't have any opportunity to exhibit or. But uh, at some point, um, there was a, a big exhibit in a kind of in the main museum in Bogota that was curated by an artist, a black artist, and they were professors at the National University. And because of that exhibit, we had the opportunity to to get um, to be known. Uh, but I, uh, during a long time, it, I had also a struggle with tokenism like uh, there was this practice of, of people kind of calling me just to kind of validate some curatorial work or something like that. So in that sense, I became very intentional if I accepted kind of an invitation or doing a, a project for a specific exhibit, I will use kind of the background of the exhibit and also kind of the, the, the audience that I would envision uh, that would assist, and in that sense, I would make the project. Uh, and since also I was working with uh, representations and racism in many cases, um, 
I also was very intentional thinking about how to address that in order to uh, get to the audience. But at some point also, I started to focus uh, my work on the black audience. Like I was kind of trying to, to have a conversation uh, through visual arts with the people in the movement. So I was kind of trying to, to generate conversations about images and the power of uh, visual representation uh, to address that with them. And in, in recent years, I, I kind of got also tired of <laughs> racism and I just focus on, on the work with the communities. Um, so, so yeah, in that sense, the projects are made with them. Uh, we work together. So, so it's very clear uh, who is the audience and, and also uh, it's very direct in the message, everything. Okay. So, I mean, is there any sense in which you think um, it's, there, there's, it makes a difference to your, the, the way you, you, do, you practice your, your art, the fact that you're to, if you're talking to mis, people who are identified as mestizo or people who identify as white, does that make any difference to you? Or are they all this, basically the same in terms of their attitudes towards indigenous people and black people in Colombia? I mean, the idea of the mestizo, the mixed people in Colombia has kind of two sides because mm. in some sense it, it has behind the project of whitening. So it was a way to kind of whiten the, the population. And it was the promise of kind of like the Colombian citizenship or the, uh, yeah, kind of um, the, the idea of erasing uh, indigenous people and black people. But in the other hand, there is the work, for example, of uh, Manuel Zapata Olivella, which thinks the, um, the idea of three ethnicity, like uh, three uh, ethnic groups that are mixed. And in that sense, uh, he addresses the richness of uh, the culture. Uh, so it's, it's kind of, uh, I think, those different views of, of mixed people. Um, kind of uh, still exist in, in Colombia, even though the, um, the politicians and kind of the power in Colombia push to the whitening process, yes. Mm -hmm. Right, so sorry, just to ask one more question on that. I mean, I, I wonder, I often ask myself if the fact that there are this, this category of mestizo people and, and especially when you understand the mestizo identity in the way that Manuel Zapato Rivella did as people who are definitely not white and who are not trying to whiten themselves, whether that means that anti-racism in, in somewhere like Colombia has got a great attraction. It's, you know, it, it has more possibilities to it than uh, in a place like, like Britain, for example, the UK. Do you think there's anything in that? I think... Um... I mean, I think the people embrace the um, uh, the idea of of mestizo also sometimes to differentiate from white. I mean, there is very specific people in Colombia that we call themselves as white, and and these people are uh, normally kind of like a high class, uh, very. Um, uh, classist, <laughs> very racist. I, I mean, they, they are very clear and, and we all know them. So many people talk about mestizo as a way to kind of differentiate. Uh, and also uh, many people embrace being black or, uh, or being indigenous, obviously. But um, I mean, in recent years, I think people, um, because of also this kind of uh, social media and uh, all that, uh, I, there is more clarity uh, in, in the identification of people. But for example, in the census, it was terrible. So the, the population identified as black uh, kind of was uh, cut in half just because the census people didn't do the questions, didn't ask. So it, it, it is a very real struggle for ethnic communities, yes. Okay. 
Ekwa, do you want to say something about your audience um, and whether they're white, mixed, etc.? How you tailor your your work towards your audience? Uh, it's interesting because uh, um, in terms of the production of my work, I I tailor it to try and speak as much as possible to the sort of universal human. Because, and I, I regard that as an anti-racist stance because of how much as African heritage people we are dehumanized by the like centuries of uh, uh, attitudes and ideas that have been created to oppress us. And so I guess when I'm doing that, if I'm thinking about sort of a, a static piece of work that I may have made, um, I might be deliberately trying to throw back uh, an image of, uh, a, say, uh, a very obvious thing. So I do um, uh, quite clearly figurative work, uh, some of my work, and I will try and then place um, language that we have not been encouraged to use around ourselves within the work. So honesty, integrity, humanity, compassion, things that we are we are separated from in the language of the sort of media about us as African people. So that the audience is everybody because all of us are in receipt of that miseducation. Um, but some of us, the, I mean, how people then receive it and how I might make that work is because for some of us, we may be having to deal with internalized oppression um, other, well, all of us will be dealing with internalized oppression, even if you are a, a white middle class man. You know, there's internalized oppression because to live with the ignorance of racism is, is oppressive to, to everybody. Um, but if I'm talking, if we're talking about a live audience, there will be just a difference, I guess, in shorthand, in language, in the comfortableness that I may, you know, in, in occupying the space I occupy, um, in my oversensitiveness to the the layers of oppressive gaze that I might be in receipt of, and I've become really aware of how sensitized I am. It's like we're always on hyper alert for attack, for den you know, being denigrated, for being undermined, for being underestimated. And that makes you sort of, you're constantly reading, reading, reading. So if my audience is very white, I have to go into maybe a different headspace. But then um, it's interesting. So as a, uh, a person of mixed heritage, who I don't, I, I so most of my life, and it's, it's quite a recent journey for me, I am uh, Irish and Nigerian in terms of my biological journey here. Yeah? I regard myself as an African and have only ever identified as an African. When I first came to Manchester, and it's quite interesting, I think there would be a very interesting conversation between some of the communities in Manchester and what you're describing in uh, South America. Because when I first came, it was like, wow, do you never see black people together? <laughs> it was like, it was it, coming from London into Manchester, it was a really odd experience. And there is actually, um, there is a, I live in Moss Side, it's historically a, a black area, though it's changing in itself. And there is a, a community where you're on third generation, at least uh, mixed people. So uh, a mixed person, and which I guess is the same as you're experiencing in South America, don't have a white parent and a black parent like I might have done biologically. I wasn't raised by my biological parents, which is why I sort of I have this sort of step aside from it. Um, but who have grandparents who are mixed, and their parents were mixed, and so they don't um, they don't they they are therefore immersed in and identify as a mixed community, which I think is quite rare. I think it's quite unique to Manchester. It'd be something interesting for Suandi to comment on because she's from Manchester, whereas I came, I think she's from Manchester, whereas I came here um, fully fledged with two kids in tow. Um, and that was something, so obviously visually, I look like a mixed race person. So I was spoken to and engaged with and I was like, that's got, I don't, I don't recognize it. I recognize and, and regard myself as an African person. Um, and uh, that's where my politics were. That's how I engage with the world. So it's taken me a long time to be sympathetic and understanding and human in my response to that mixed 
community as, a, as an identifiably different community. And I still question the political strength in that, uh, because I am a very political person. I question the sort of ideology behind that, the sort of socialist principle behind that. Uh, so I'm still on a, a journey. So um, in terms of, but I think my job, and, and one of the things this year as an artist is, and I think I'm on a different journey because I've committed most of my time to communities and working with them. And I'm now on this side of being a maker as an artist rather than, it's almost like we're in an opposite place, Liliana, in terms of journeys through our careers, um, is that um, I, I think I have a, a responsibility as a person who makes media, uh, the artist and the, as I'm a media maker as an artist and therefore it's really important that I push against the mainstream messages whatever they are and that's the the anti-racist action that I take constantly within my work and I think that's something I'm really wanting to push because I mean I don't even know I've never explored the statistic but something like in the UK 80% of our media is owned by three billionaires and that you know therefore that it is not on our side and we know the power of it. Therefore, we have a responsibility, I think, as artists to take our place within the media as a whole and try and change and shape that dialogue. But with everybody, with everybody, I seek my allies. I have a, a, a home, a heart, a place as an African woman, but I seek to, I seek to draw on my strength as an African woman to love everybody, to fight against the negativity, but to love everybody. God, I'm not that sort of hippie person that came across here. But we can dig into that a bit later. So, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you, Ikwa. <laughs> Diana, do you want to say something about what difference it makes to you that 40% of people in Brazil identify as, as brown, as pardo, when you're talking to your audience? Or doesn't it make any difference to you? I don't know. I think it's a tricky question. I, I don't. I'm not sure if I really understood what you what you want to know. Uh, but I need to remember that uh, the European invasion in this part of the world literally decimated the indigenous population in the first century. Like in 100 years, we had 100 million deaths of indigenous persons, and today in Brazil. Uh, we are considered to be less than 1% of the national population. And even like that, we are more than 300 indigenous nations. Uh, we have uh, almost 200 indigenous languages that are still alive. And um, I don't know, I, 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 personally, I don't think I do art uh, planning to dialogue with a kind of public. But uh, that's something that you made me think about. And, and if I have a, a kind of public, maybe I have three kinds of public. Uh, first of all, my nation, uh, the Tucano nation, uh, because being indigenous is not a matter of um, uh, genetical traces for us. It's belonging to a nation is belonging to a civilization, an indigenous civilization. And so I am Tucano, first of all. And then I am indigenous because the Western civilization made that difference, uh, made that classification uh, of indigenous peoples. And then I am Brazilian and et cetera and so on. And, on. and uh, but I believe I have three different ways of dialogue. So uh, maybe and the depth of the dialogue is really different between Tucano and then between indigenous and then between non-indigenous that can uh, access uh, my my art and um, and Brazil has a very a uh, particular story, political story as well. Uh, we were a country that used to be an empire. It was like the, the only empire in South America. And we still uh, are a very racist country, especially towards this. Uh, we may be like the, the country with the largest black population of, uh, outside Africa, but we are one of the countries with the tiniest indigenous population in America, in South America. And um, uh, so every time that uh, an indigenous 
anything appears, uh, it is like target of uh, many attacks in several ways of people that uh, used to say like here is like um, é, não sei como que fala ditado em inglês, Jamile. <laughs> It's like a uh, microfone. <laughs> A saying, a saying, there's a saying, uh, ditado. It's a saying that a good Indian is a dead Indian. We deal with that all the time. Uh, we used to deal Stop with, it. like, uh, in, the, in the comments in social media or in um, in journals and etc. like the comments is like uh, that indigenous are something from the past that we are not supposed to be here. And when you are native in the American continent, that is North and South, uh, there is no way to have like a white folk or a non-indigenous folk telling you, hey, go home. <laughs> Because we are originary nations, we are native. And, um, and so, um, Of course, it's really challenging uh, to deal with all those uh, relations uh, of the identity relation towards the territory or the national identity. Uh, but I believe that mainly uh, the the thing is really about the chalk or the dialogue or the trying uh, of dialogue uh, between uh, cultures, between epistemologies, between uh, cosmovisions, uh, because we, we are different cultures. If we talk about indigenous peoples in Brazil, I'm talking about more than 300 different civilizations, more, uh, more than 300 different uh, stories of creation, stories of relating to the woods uh, that share Uh, the resistance uh, to colonialism, that share the resistance to violence and to racism. And uh, even in our great uh, diversity, we have to dialogue with one culture, that is the Western culture, that still is racist and patriarchist and etc. and etc. and etc. trying to um, put us under invisibility or um, just to hear with us. And um, so, uh, uh, I don't know, I, it's really a, a tricky question for me, thinking about the public. Um, I believe that uh, I have a, even a different relation to art, uh, because uh, in my language, in my nation, there is no word for art. Uh, art is a Western concept. Uh, and when I say Western, Western concept is non-indigenous and non-black is like a white concept, it's an European concept. And the way that you uh, defined art and relate to art and created, created a, an art system and an art market and an art academy can be really different to the way that we relate to what you consider to be art. And... Um, So, um, as we say in Portuguese, o buraco é mais embaixo. Like, the hole is quite under us. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Diana. Can I, um, can I just maybe I should respond to that? Yes, of I, I do think that yes. it, is, it is weird, actually, having this conversation. There are sort of constraints around it in terms of, like, That, that the notions that we're we're, we're asked, being asked to dis discuss our work, but in the context of notions of art that probably are quite alien to us, to all of us, I think, in many ways. And when what you just said there reminded me of a, and I don't know who is the person who said it. It's, it's an African saying, saying, and and it was it, it was saying that the difference between uh, African art and Western art is in uh, African art, it's about a process of forever creating. And in the West, it's about creating uh, uh, little forevers. You know, that's our whole monument and value. And it's like this great thing you put in a building and you say is worth loads of money. It's sort of, it's distancing. It's, it's concretizing the actual end product rather than celebrating the actual process of, of creativity. Uh, so I'm really interested in the fact that you said there's no word for art, but are there words that you think relate to 
the things that we mean when we talk about art. Aya. I don't know. For me, in my in my last days, I've, I've been thinking that, uh, for example, I don't I don't really believe that uh, my, uh, that me doing like contemporary indigenous art is something like decolonial. I'm more for the counter colonialism. Uh, I believe we need to reaffirm our identities to make space and uh, in towards the relation to art. Uh, something that we really need to reaffirm is another uh, way of relating to the universe and uh, skip uh, anthropocentric thinking. Uh, so uh, I am not an art creator. I am not an artist. It's not something, it's not about what I do create, but it's how I relate to create, let the creation go through me and I can be a channel to that, that is more, much more larger than me. And so that is a different relation to, to the universe, to the cosmos, and how we approach and understand what is the function and the nature of art itself. So maybe uh, questioning and uh, decolonization and countercolonization is, for me at least, is all about questioning also the end of the anthropocentric thing. <laughs> Okay, interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I mean, I can just say a little bit more about why I, why I asked, I posed the question in those terms that I started with, which is that um, you know, there's something generic about anti-racism, which is that it's a kind of a global nature. It's like a, the discourse of human rights. You know, you can globalize it. The anti-racism, whether it's in Australia or Latin America or Europe or the United States, it's all trying to achieve the same thing, which is racial equality, racial justice, and so on. Um, but then for me, I'm interested in whether the particular you know, context that you're working from makes a difference to how you practice your anti-racism. So that's, you know, if you're trying to be an anti-racist in Latin America, you're dealing with a particular kind of context in which you have that history of mixture. And if you're being an anti-racist in uh, Europe, you're dealing with a very different context in which immigration is the main thing because uh, you know it's the, it was a colonial center and all the presence of blackness and so on is, is basically associated with processes of immigration from colonial areas colonized areas so they're very different contexts and i i'm interested in whether those contexts makes a dip make a difference to the way that you should then try and practice your anti-racism or the way that you do practice your anti-racism or the kind of traction that you can get with your anti-racist activities, whether they are political interventions or artistic interventions. So that's why I asked that, that question. Um, and Is I think it possible it's that we don't, point. it feels to me that it's possible that we, that we don't practice our anti-racism. There's something weird about no. that statement. Um, we are, we live as a constant, with racism as an oppressive force. And for, as women, we live in the intersection of uh, um, uh, 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 the gender-based oppression. And we also, you know, so, and many of us will also live around class or, you know, like, uh, so I, I, I find that a really odd, an odd statement. It's like, it reminds me of um, that question about what is black art. And, and, mm. and for me, it's like, anything I produce because of who I am is black art that mm. you know it's like and some people object and they say therefore it's just there is no such term but I think I, I'm really a, attached to it because I want to value and celebrate it but I the idea that um I I don't know maybe Sue Andrew, you were saying this I I can't imagine that I ever pick up and go at this moment I'm not fighting racism and at this moment, I am fighting racism. There is, I, I just don't understand it. I don't, I, I, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I think there is, <clears throat> but, that, but that is because I think we need to look at fighting against racism as a much more global concept. I mean, there's things that I, I mentioned, I've mentioned it briefly earlier about, you know, the racist, the, the anti-racist action of just self-care, of, of love, of being, of, 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 of joy, of dance, of just breathing, of holding, you know your grandfather or your granddaughter or you know th these are action are anti-racist actions as far as i'm concerned so mm. I, I, 
yeah, I, yeah no, I, I, I can see what you mean, but I mean, I, you know, whether, whether you, I guess maybe it's because I'm, my background is working with organizations who are, you know, anti-racist and so they have particular campaigns and particular things that they're trying to achieve. So they are, they design particular kinds of interventions. But even if you take your anti-racism as being something you live all the time, then it would, I guess, make a difference whether you're living that, that you know, you're having that lived experience in one context rather than another context. But anyway. I do find, I mean, I would really like to explore the fact that the others are working within institutions mm. because I no longer can. And I'd really be interested in seeing how it is, you know, what is the difference there? Why, why are you able to have that part? I, I've also witnessed watching people who are still working within institutions and the damage it does to them, or I, what I perceive on the outside as damage. So, you know, that's me being value judging. And so yeah. there are, there are other differences that we that we I would really like to explore. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask a question about institutions later on, but we can move to that now if you want. Um, does people want to chip oh, in? Can I that? just uh, can I just jump in yeah. about this anti-racist artwork? Um, yeah. And I can't remember the brother's name, so it'll probably pop up in my life within the next couple of days. But it was when just after Nelson Mandela had been released from prison. Mm. And I saw somebody's trying to desperately trying to ring me. And um, he was a member. He was a member of African Dawn. And I saw him on the streets of London. Walked up to him and said, "Isn't it wonderful? Mandela's going to be free." And he said, "Yeah." And I don't have to do any more. He swore um, anti-racist gigs. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I, a moment I didn't understand. And then I did understand why were we as black people performing for free for anti-racist gigs when it should have been done by white people. So who should be making anti-racist work? Is it necessarily us or is it our white colleagues? That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah I would say everyone, yeah, but uh, sure. Yeah, everyone. So, you know, the, the questions you're kind of laying heavy on us you could lay elsewhere yeah i could do and we do i mean we're not only I mean, it just so <laughs> happens that we're talking to um black and indigenous artists here but uh we could have invited other other artists that we're working with as well now but anyway should we talk about people's relationships to institutions in the art world i, I think that uh, raised her hand too okay Diana, did you want to say something yeah, I believe it goes to this institutional issue that, uh, I don't know, but um, if we are talking about anti-racist art, maybe it's just reaffirming the idea that art is by itself a racist space uh, and that is marked by, by very racist institution, as the academy, as the museums, the gallery, all this jet set, whatever, uh, bourgeois, white jet set of art uh, that is really um, um uh, oh my god <laughs> i need to think in portuguese que não aceita que não deixa entrar os os que não são brancos como é que fala isso <laughs> the people who don't let in those who aren't yeah. white yeah it's a, it's a space that it has been that was created just to reaffirm white superiority or whatever i don't know how it's called uh, mm -hmm. the museums by itself are like the most representative spaces of colonialism and um the the collections and and the um, uh, uh, the exotification of other cultures that are not European cultures uh, and, uh, and the narratives that are set in the academy is very racist and is a very important uh, tool to uh, promote until today uh, the ethnocide, the genocide, it's not just uh, a, a annihilation of cultures and something that really kills people in the street every day. 
So be making a step into that space, reaffirming a different identity and a different speech, a different a different relation uh, um, to society and a different uh, history speech is by itself a rebellion and it's by itself an anti-racist move, you know? Uh, and it's really challenging because as a non-white, non-Western artist, we deal with all kind of racism all the time uh, with uh, the, um, uh, como é que fala a diminuição, uh, uh, the devaluing of our art, uh, the exotization of our art, the classification as just indigenous or just black, I don't know, uh, but less than a greatest uh, fine art and uh, or as if we were just making, como que fala, cota? Quota. <laughs> a quota. A quota in what they believe they need to be like politically correct to uh, make their, their illusion that they are democratic of something. Uh, when we know that we still live under a colonizing culture under uh, genocide uh, today. And uh, so the problem is really much more bigger than that, you know? Mm. Uh, by myself in the academy, for example, uh, what, are, what is in the history books? Uh, how uh, are the classifications, the art classifications are made in history? Even in ancient history, even in archeology, span people in the originary peoples from all over the planet are not recognized. We have our um, um, autonomy denied in the way that we identify ourselves. So uh, art is a space of dispute and art is a space of power and uh, is a space of faith dismantling and questioning racism all the time. That's it. Okay, thank you. Liliana, you wanted to say something? Yes, I, I think uh, Dayara has been very clear. I, I agree in that uh, academy, museums, archives, uh, botanical gardens are all institutions that, are, that were created by colonialism and are kind of in the base of uh, what we understand uh, as culture and as um, art, uh, knowledge, science, all that. So in that sense, I think uh, most of the work that uh, we do has to go, has to do with or undermining kind of, or was, uh, were the power behind those concepts. Um, so I have been working a lot with institutions in, in the sense of uh, like, for example, we did um, with uh, kind of organizations in Medellin, in, in one of the Colombian cities. We work with the main museum in the city, which is a kind of like a 19th century museum, uh, which at the beginning collected all the, um, how do you say, when they stole the tombs of the indigenous people, uh, saqueo, I don't know how to say that. Yeah, sacking, I mean, just saqueo. Uh, tomb, tomb robbing, uh, tomb robbing, grave robbing. Tomb, tomb robbing, robbing. Tomb. All, all the collection, yeah, it was uh, done by the um, kind of the elites, but also uh, men that were considered like scientists. So what you find in those museums is uh, kind of the, um, the culture of indigenous people that was robbed uh, and also the white supremacy idea of art. So what we did with this um, group of uh, black uh, organizers and kind of artists, uh, cultural leaders was kind of work with the museum in what that means because the, the only thing that was 
uh, related with a black person in that museum was um, a document in which they had sell a person that was in enslavement. So it was a document that named uh, a black man that was 22 years old. And that was the only thing they had. And, and it was inherited probably from one of these uh, families in the region. So um, what we found uh, looking at their collection and it was kind of like the expression of racism. I mean, every, everything is validated by uh, Colombian art history. And there were many representations of black people made by white artists. Uh, and in very subtle ways, uh, those representations kind of um, keep uh, the oppression because it was, it was kind of the way they represented, the way they use art to represent uh, it was to, it was, it was showing uh, oppression and uh, people being submitted. Submitted. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if I'm talking in English anymore. But, um, That's superiority. But what we found was there was this, yeah, their superiority exactly. So what we found was this artist that was from the same generation of Fernando Botero, which probably you all know this painter, Colombian painter that paint um, a very big people on, and all that, which is like an icon for Colombia and for Medellin and for Antioquia, this region. And this artist was um, a black artist from Medellin, but nobody knew he was black and he was as important as Botero, same generation, they were to the same school. Uh, so, so it was like, um, uh, a very interesting experience for, for the people that participated, the organizations and the leaders, but also for how to, how to relate with the collection and try to tell a different story. I understand that has its limitations. I mean, because still it, it was a project. We did kind of find these artists, the Rodrigo Barrientos was his name, he died in Paris because he couldn't make it as an artist in Colombia, so he had to migrate to Europe. Uh, but still, uh, it kind of, um, it was an experience for, for uh, everybody to, to kind of un to understand how the power of the museum works, how you can relate with that. So in that sense, we have also worked with archives we, because it's, I mean, in that sense, Colombia is terrible. There is no memory of our ancestors. There is uh, the, the, the memory obviously is re was written by people in power. So um, in other projects, we found these important painters that were part of the bot botanical exhibition the, uh, expedition in, in this territory. And they were uh, black painters that they were completely erased from art history in, in Colombia. So in that sense, the archives gives also the opportunity to find um, that memory and kind of um, a, do a process of preparation uh, using arts. So I am interested in, interested in that kind of uh, research and project and, and also working <laughs> as a public servant in an institution uh, is very, is very hard sometimes. I know what Equa was saying is it, sometimes it's kind of soul, um, how do you say? Healing. Soul destroying. <laughs> soul destroying. Yeah. Soul destroying. Yeah. But also, um, I guess, um, what I see also is, is, is the opportunity to, to do things. We, uh, work very hard, but uh, but um, but it's um, it's a structural. Like in this city in Bogota, the new mayor has a, a kind of a, they call it development plan, and for the first time uh, there is a space for the ethnic uh, communities. So for the first time, uh, the ethnic communities, the black communities, the indigenous communities that live in the city 
the um, Rome, I don't know how to, uh, Gypsy, gypsies, mm -hmm, Roma, the Gypsy Roma. community, um, and also the Raizal, which is kind of the Caribbean, uh, the roots people, um, are recognized, and that uh, is the possibility to make public policies in all aspects of the lives uh, of these people, but also uh, in the arts. So in that sense, it's, it's, a, it's a very good opportunity to do things with the communities. Mm. Good, great, yeah, thank you. Equa, you, I mean, Equa and Suanda, you both worked very, very much with uh, the art, sort of the institutions of the art world and so on to some extent. So have you got any comments you want to make about your experiences in that regard? I just wanted to say that we are all, despite who our oppressors have been, and, you know, to be fair, most of Europe has oppressed most of the black countries of the globe. And, and the power of money, the power of wealth has, has been a real problem for us in that way to keep us poor, is to keep us down. And in America, in the North particularly, what the African-American community did there was they valued their art. You go into any insurance building, you will see artwork there. They were able, because the black dollar was, was regarded as valuable in America, they were able to invest in their artists in a way that we definitely couldn't do in the UK because the black pound's never been valued in the UK and I despite any of my sisters here ever had any regard in the fiscal situation of their countries. So in that sense the exoticism of our of our work has been a real issue to regard it as primitive and if not primitive exotic. And we've and we've fallen between those. They're not two small stones. They're these huge mountains of prejudice against the value of our work. I know in the UK, African dancing, drumming, for years was not regarded as, and we agree now about the use of this word art as a valuable art form, a, an art form that was worth investment. It, it was almost like, isn't that something they do in their villages back in Africa? And therefore it has no worth. You know, we have struggled in the classics of, of, of dance, Bali in particular, to be respected as, as artists. Yet now we have, I can't think of his name, but the Brazilian dancer that, that women over here, you know, desire to be with, etc. It's a slow change, but it's, it is controlled by the fiscal po pocket. My experience of um, the institutions in, in the UK is they're not all run by demons. But even those at the top are fighting those at the bottom who have their own blinkers on their eyes who do not wish to see. And I think the benefit of new technology, the World Wide Web, etc., is allowing us to look across at the family across the globe and learn from them and learn from each other. Because I really want to ask Liana about your work. I'm particularly um, interested in the pieces that you've used the minstrel in. Do you call it a minstrel, Liana? Um, in Colombia, we don't use that name, but yeah, I understand but, what you but mean. But for me, people. because that is the minstrel, at first I thought in, in, in England we had a, a doll called a gollywog. And at first I thought it was meant to be that, then I realized it was a minstrel. Um, and even though you don't call it that, it shows how that misrepresentation of black people stretched right across the globe. And now you're, mm. in, is that the right word, inverting it? to come back as an attack um, and I love the, I love the work you've done around um, black women and hair you know the way you've, you've built the pieces on the head again our hair has been ridiculed for years for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years the nappy head sort of thing and 
it's only in probably the last 30 years that we've reclaimed that and said we're proud of what we've got you know the perfect woman doesn't have long blonde hair and i think to go back to peter's question that's how we fight it we fight that 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 racism just by producing work that we understand and we hope the other audience will look at and question and ponder and wonder but we definitely need to have comrades in that and some of those comrades are in institutions i have knowledge of people have gone in black people have gone in and really really suffered um and it's very difficult on the outside to give the support to somebody who's on a staff team where they're constantly being questioned about their ability their judgments their opinions you just hope you can be there for them if they're brave enough to say it's really bad in here and i need help and i don't blame anybody that doesn't feel they want to say that because it it might make them seem like as though they're failing mm. um what a stop <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah, um, it's an interesting question to ask me around institutions yeah. um and, and also to sort of ponder and what uh, both Liliana and I have said in terms of the powerful impact of just being in them, just existing, just walking down the street in our body. Um, and then the work that we can do against the backdrop of the emotional toil that that takes. And I suppose what I'm doing constantly is thinking about uh, the... Does, is there a, a balance? Does the, uh, is, is the, does it come out in favour of staying and fighting within the institutions? I'm sure you do this on a daily basis. Well, I did when I was in them. Um, what I what I what I wonder is about the sustainability of us working within those institutions without there being a real overhaul and how much the, these can be very temporary having worked within those institutions that it is the changes that you can make can be incredibly tem temporary because often we are not in positions of, of a great deal of power in terms of longevity of planning uh, longevity in terms of control um, so that like I mean I, I was I, I yeah I I, I know that I've made a choice to withdraw being employed by actually by anyone, but because I'm an artist within institutions, because by the, when I balanced it up, it wasn't worth the, the it, it didn't come out in my favor. It came out in the favor of me probably dying sooner than, than I will do. That's, that's me being blatant about that in terms of my age. And I also then, question though I, I i get it in terms of us the political acting just being there but i think i'm at the point where i don't think it's enough that it doesn't create enough change um without a really strong ideological and political base of understanding what that means because what will happen is then why institutions will subvert that action and they will find what I call the blockers, the gate closers, and they will place those, those our brothers and sisters in those positions because we've said that it's a revolutionary act for us to walk down the corridors of these places of power. So they go, oh, we'll put this one in and because they know this one won't challenge and it won't act. I'm, and I'm not laying out your foundations. I'm just because I know that is not who you are. But I do think that is a problem with how institutions engage with us because um, either we can't sustain it uh, or they find uh, ways of, 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 it's like we are constantly having to reinvent the battleground that we're fighting on. So it may be very different. I feel it's a lost bat battleground in the UK. I no longer have, a, I mean, I'm, hmm, I go, I, I come and go in my engagement with institutions and then I, I have to constantly decide is that worth going back to and fighting? And I, I, I'm, I'm happy to give examples. So um, I'm sure like everybody, the, the Black Lives Matter global uprising has impacted. 
and there was a wave of arts organizations in the UK of sort of scrambling to come out with statements of how they were going to look at their employment and look at the work they did, their programming in light of the global uh, Black Lives Global Uprising in, in the light of, oh, they've suddenly noticed that black people are killed or that they're suddenly, they've suddenly been aware of that. But I mean, I call it that we're at war. I also believe that genocide is happening. And I think what the pandemic has exposed is the level of that genocide happening in advanced Western civilizations in the West, in the UK, in England. You know, people, you know, the fact that the fact that we are dying from uh, non-white communities in the numbers that we are is not to do with some genetic, uh, either it's not to do with how the pandemic works or our genetic weakness, it's to do with the sustained attack our communities have been under and that we have been dying anyway. We've been dying and dying and being both killed and dying and it's like we're in this invisible war and, our, and I'm desperate for my white comrades to actually recognize and step up and recognize we're at war. So then I look at institutions and I look at what they're doing and I, and I hear these statements. So recently, um, over this last year, I have had conversations with the big galleries in my city, with, with Art Gallery and the Manchester Art Gallery, both scrambled to make statements in response to uh, Black Lives Matter, to look at their programming and saying, this is the time, the time is right, come and talk to us. And uh, at, at the same time, my studio has uh, has lost its its place. We, we've been um, we we can't afford the rent that our our um, landlords want to place on us. They believe they can get a commercial rent in the middle of the pandemic. They think somebody out there wants to pay twenty thousand pounds for our space, so they're getting rid of us. I thought ideal. He's saying the institutions are open and listening, and they're aware of the great inequalities, and they want to hear from black artists. So I make an arrangement, okay, come help us, what can you do? The first thing they do is, oh, we've made a mistake with our scheduling, we've only got half an hour. <laughs> now, that wouldn't be so bad if they then afterwards, wouldn't it, came back to me and said, well, we're really, really sorry we only had half an hour. Let's pick that up, let's keep that going. They haven't. Then it was like, well, no, we really, because we've got, yeah, we're looking at giving this mezzanine level over to the community, to artists, but we've got ideas how we're going to do it. And I'm like, so you are already saying we are going to share this in response to the back, but we're controlling it. We're in charge of the agenda. We'll let you come over and maybe you'll explore our collection in this way. And maybe, and I'm, and I just said, I mean, I, I probably, but from my perspective, it was like, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. If we either innovate and we come in as equals and we come in with, and you hand over some power to us within this space, I'm not coming in to shape or flavor or, or deal with that or your, you know, to make you more comfortable with your programming because it doesn't create long-term change here. I think things are different in different places. So it's not, mm -hmm. but I'm really interested in what are the support mechanisms for you as individuals? What are the support mechanisms in there? Because it is different. Having a 40% population who you can speak to, engage with, who maybe have some more fiscal, not all of them, obviously, and, and actually, you're talking about one percent so that you are both in very very different places actually I, I don't even know how we can have one conversation uh you know there is no nor you know there's no similarity between a one percent population and a 40 percent population and we exist um supposedly in a four percent population but um actually that is also split and split and split and split into lots of different things and i'm part indigenous ultimately i'm part irish so, and then the Irish themselves have a history of oppression, which they can step away from because give it a, a couple of generations and they just become other white English people if they choose to. Um, I'll just leave it at that. I'm just really mm. interested in how is it, what keeps us sane as artists working with institutions? So you're doing that work, you're walking those corridors and then you are, oh, and the last thing I wanted to say was, I refuse to allow that the only world the only space that is called art are those racist institutions because art for me is an empowering tool it is the it is the place where everybody can have a voice where everybody can exist and be valued and therefore i can't just assign art to the space of money of class of power and wealth i think that's the great and i think it's the it is the great 
um, lie that is being told by the establishment to disenfranchise us from the art making practice by constantly pushing this message of of, of um, privilege and separateness. And it's the and it's the lie that I really want us to unpick and say that isn't the case. There is a the massive world of art making that belongs to all people from the moment of birth to the moment of death. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Liliana, you work <laughs> for the, um, you know, uh, an institution, the Bogota City Council. Do you want to say something about whether you think that that's what your experience has been I, in that situation? <clears throat> I completely agree with Equa. I mean, I worked with the institutions before um, until I worked with, like for, I guess, like 10 years. Uh, because I, in order to finance my, my own practice as an artist, I started with these jobs kind of in the institutions. I work with the visual arts kind of uh, office for the city. And then in 2015, I, I finally was out of them and I decided just to work as an artist. And... I, I guess at some point I was kind of afraid because it's very hard for us uh, to just live as an artist because the art market here is very much um, Eurocentric, white. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard for, for us as black artists to kind of, um, yeah, just live with our work. But I did, um, and I was doing it until I was called um, in, in February this year. So I guess, I mean, I have experienced everything you have described because it's, uh, it's, it's really hard because it's Colombia, uh, the way racism uh, works in Colombia is very uh, kind of tricky because it's, it's part of our structure. I mean, it's completely institutionalized. Uh, so in that sense, when you walk those corridors, uh, you you have your own mind saying that you probably don't deserve to be there and all that, because it's how uh, we have been kind of raised, and and also because how people interact in these kind of positions of power. So so they all feel that they have the right to be in that seat and to look at you as if you don't. So all that I have experienced, of course. Um, but also, I guess in the in some sense, I don't know if I am naive or, <laughs> but I, I what I realize is that for many people, for many uh, colleagues, many artists, um, kind of the struggle of indigenous people and black people in Colombia is is something that they kind of just don't empathize with i mean for many people in the arts is kind of like it's not their problem is it's not their issue um so so kind of even having affirmative actions for many people uh, in colombia is considered unjust like why are you giving people uh, black people or indigenous people uh, a little part of the of the cake is is just for them. Um, uh, they 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 can even be very aggressive about that. So so for example, what I, what I was telling you about how in this government specifically there is a, a, a gain because it was gained by the people a, to have the right to be part of the development a uh, project of this major uh, is huge because it's the first time i mean there has been little bit of affirmative actions but to have an article in that document that says that uh, ethnic groups have the right in in bogota to to have a space to have their their own voices uh, to, to sit at the table to agree with the authorities of the city about the budgets, about the, that, that's huge. 
So, so that's what is happening at this moment in time. It could happen effectively. It has happened before that something that people gain, then somebody else gets to to the government of the city and everything is erased. That we have experienced that is very hard when you have worked for years to kind of gain something and then everything is just erased uh, by somebody uh, just very easy in a second is is very hard but mm -hmm. um but i guess I, I mean the struggle continues everything that even in the arts in bogota we have uh, at this moment uh, is because the people in the culture and the arts have fight have fought for it because uh, nobody's given to nothing is given to us mm -hmm. mm, okay interesting any more comments or about uh, institutions and one's experience with institutions or we could move on to something else? I think I want to go back to something about the empowerment and having that fiscal support because in the UK and it is as Eka has said it's so completely different with such a small percentage our history on this particular island because it, after all it's just an island has not been as bloodied you know, of massacre, of taking away land and property and everything like that. But what we've not managed to do until really quite recently is document our achievements. So that means we can fall foul of reinventing the wheel, thinking we're the first to have done that, that no one's done it before. Um, and, and it's really quite frustrating to hear people speaking that way you know i'm going to be the first and you think wow you're not and um, and it's because i think the modern mind fails to look back to see what they can learn from those who have gone before which is why history in its fullest sense has always intrigued me because i i want to know what other people have done whether that's been in you know, in the social setting or the arts or anything like that so I think bravery is our the first medal that we should polish. I think we're very brave because we get up and we face we face the day. But I don't think any of us wake up and think, I'm waking up today as a black woman to go out into the white world. I don't think we think like that. But we are brave when we step out and we're brave when we go to seminars and conferences and pitch our work because the eyes that are assessing it do not look like our eyes. And we just have to hope that those eyes are not on the faces of an enemy in the, in the real meaning of that sense, that there is a compassion and a desire to understand from the work it's there. And when it's not there, believe you me, I can become a warrior. I will fight for my people. You know, leading Black Hearts Alliance has given me the great privilege of working with visual artists and dancers and drummers and everybody like that and it's much easier in a sense because I'm not a visual artist to go into a gallery and fight for an exhibition because I, I can't be accused of trying to promote myself so I understand the difficulties of the visual artist or the museum into a concert whatever you know the connection connective institution is to to fight for their self. And that's why I go back and say collective, we are much better. And in a way, if this doesn't sound stupid, I am somewhat envious of, of you both, Daria and Liana, because you have that unification of, of your own people. As Erica, Erica, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Ekua, has just explained, we're quite disparate in the UK. Um, our history of migration has come on different timelines, you know, from early Africans coming into the Caribbean, you've heard, perhaps heard about the Windrush generation, to Asian people coming from Uganda. So we've had to really fight to bring ourselves together and it doesn't always work. I think the establishment is is very nervous when they see the power of as a collective, collective people, which is why they've tried to keep keep you down in your own countries, 
tried to keep you poor and tried to keep you ethnic when you said about um, ethnic minorities who who has the nerve to record to their fellow citizen as an ethnic minority are they not an ethnic minority themselves the labeling is always onto the other and we are always the other in the uk now although it's it's no it's becoming unpopular i'll say that we have this terminology how do you pronounce it I guess um, it BAME. Um, um, yeah. Black and I, Asian minority ethnic. If you could look at the word ethnic, the original meaning of that is heathen and pagans, not of the Christian belief. Minority as black people globally, we are not a minority. But the real issue there is that there are a small group of people at the top deciding what we will be called. I am not a BAME. I am a black woman of mixed heritage, very close to yours because I'm Liverpool Irish on my mother's side and Nigerian on my father's side. I title myself. It is that power that keeps trying to push us into what we call over here pigeonholes that keeps trying to keep us contained. And I think it's our determination, even though we might fall over and weep and we might cry and scream and all those emotional responses, but it is our determination to stop that happening, to bring it to the end. And behind us is the next generation. I don't just mean that in years or era or as simple as that. But behind us, we have to make sure there are more warriors behind us. Daria, I love um, from your quote, I'm going to read it. You say, um, our body, our territory and our mind. Yes. And I think for a lot of us, that's how we hope. Um, that that's how we hope we live our lives. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to pick up on something that Suandi raised in relation to Liliana's work, which is the, the, the role of the stereotype. And I wonder if each of you would like to say something about how you deal with stereotypes of black people or indigenous people and whether you think it's important to kind of attack those stereotypes in your work or whether you just take them for granted or you think you're not interested in that or how do you relate to the question of stereotype? Because I know for you, Liliana, that's been that's been something that figured quite strongly in your work. Uh, you know, earlier on, 20 years ago, perhaps you were playing a lot with stereotypes of black people, subverting them, satirizing them, exaggerating them, caricaturing them and so on. And maybe that's less has become less important for you now at this particular time. So I just wonder if if each of you wants to say something about you know, stereotypes and stereotyped imagery and how significant that is in your in your work. I, I just would like to say something about that, those words, those series. And I think at, at the moment I kind of didn't realize it, but I, I now I think that I was dealing with the pain. I think it was, um, kind of uh, facing uh, that because when I started doing this type of work, I was uh, working about the word Negro, Negro, um, and how we relate with that word. Uh, because in, in Colombia, uh, you know, Peter, it's very complex, the relationship with that word uh, in the sense that um, Kind of, we have learned to embrace it in in order to to fight uh, to fight for uh, the struggle, but also um, uh, obviously it has all these um, kind of background of colonization and slavery and all that. So at the moment, I I was kind of dealing um, with that in order to understand it. So I use it uh, on my own body and kind of. Uh, I, it was very ambivalent for, because for me all these works are are very 
uh, painful. I mean, but uh, some people, because how we have learned to to live with racism for, for some people was kind of uh, funny. So um, it was very ambivalent. And I kind of deal with that tension for, for a while. Mm. And that was intentional in many installations and kind of work that I did. And it was also kind of doing um, kind of like an archeology span of how these images came to our daily life. In, in Colombia, because as, as you say, for the, for the US or for uh, other parts of the world, it, the world is a kind of the minstrel. For us, is a kind of a tradition that comes uh, from religious images, also kind of like, obviously slavery, but how the colonial uh, Spaniards, um, uh, the colonizers, how they they deal with these kind of representations, in order to um, to also implement slavery in these territories. So, so I guess for me it was also understanding how those images came about, and how the word negro became part of our identity. And when I was growing up, everybody was telling me, "Tú eres negra, you are you are black, you have to be proud of that." Uh, but in that sense, um, um, there are many tensions in the world negro or negra in Colombia. Diana, do you want to do you want to say something? Because the image of the indigenous, especially the indigenous woman, as a, a highly sexualized being in 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 Brazil and in Latin America, but particularly in Brazil, is a very powerful one. So, how do you deal with those? stereotypes in your artistic work? It's not a question in my work. Personally, uh, some sometimes somebody asked me if I was a cannibal, if, I, if my nation used to eat people. It was in the Federal Congress in Brasilia. Somebody in the Federal Congress asked me if I eat people. I don't give a damn. And uh, sometime another one asked me um, if I was really an indigenous or an Indian. I love this word here. Uh, because I was using glasses or because I was using a cell phone. Here, uh, there is this uh, really uh, stupid misconception that indigenous are supposed to be in isolation in the middle of the forest wearing no clothes and dying of malaria or something like that. Um, of course, it is something that is present in our society. And for myself, I used to walk and talk more about that in human rights walks and research and uh, uh, in the working as an independent communicator in the indigenous radio and uh, doing as you are doing, like interviews and talking with other indigenous things. But uh, in my artwork by itself, it's not one of the standards. And more than. Diana, you're breaking up, I'm afraid. What? Are You're you breaking up. We, we can't Can hear you, I'm afraid. Really? Oh my God. Maybe. Can you? Well. Yeah? No? Yeah, maybe. It, okay, let's try again. Or maybe we can, can give it another try there. Can you hear me now? I, I think so. <laughs> maybe we should maybe we should come back to you in a minute. Maybe your your internet connection will stabilize. Okay, should we come back to you later? In in just a yeah. minute. Okay. Uh Equa okay. or, or Suandi, do you want to say anything about stereotypes and how they figure in your work and whether they're important for you in, in what you do? Challenging. Um See you, Andy, you go ahead. Yeah, challenging. Yeah, but I was just thinking about, you know, no alls, no alls who want to say, I, you know, when I 
first, I suppose, became professional working in schools. I got my first workshop in a school outside Manchester. I arrived at the school and the head teacher looked at me and said, oh, we were expecting an African. Hmm. And I said, well, I am African. To which she replied, where is your drum? So I think there's a, a very arrogant know all this about who we are as people by the by by the, the majority of society, by the white side of society. You know, I'm just relating to that horrific question, you know, did did you used to eat people? We're not that many years beyond that question, to be truthful, are we? Let's go like, you know, the between the World War One and World War Two, those questions were asked, and for a few years after that as well. There's now an intele intellectual ignorance where people feel very confident to ask the most ridiculous questions of us um the stereotyping of us from skin tone you know people assume if you're light-skinned you have to be mixed race which is not necessarily the case where now as i'm older um people think i'm not mixed race because now they've got an idea that mixed race has a certain hair texture and skin tone, you know, not helped by the the Megan, um, the Megan mania that came in through advertising. If you look at advertising on the television, every couple we see is as a mixed couple. Mm. It, you know, it's pathetic, really. It's it's, yeah. it's always what they do in this country is OTT without understanding. So. Stereotyping is just, you know what it is? It's the label that calls me an angry black woman. That's the stereotyping. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just angry. I'm every other emotion that says I'm like a volcano some days. And you're very, very lucky that I don't bite. So stereotype <laughs> on that. Really. <laughs> Equa, do you want to say something about stereotypes or? I always remember reading something, and I don't know, it was, I'm sure, a book that said from stereotype to archetype or archetype to stereotype. And I think, I think we sort of play in those margins between stereotype and archetype, listening oh, yeah. in terms of our work all the time. Um, certainly, uh, I have a whole body of work that was around, um, yeah, I, uh, of trying to turn, put stereotypes on their head. In terms of a personal, I mean, I, I, the thing that I live, I try and live as honestly as I can is that my experience and what I've lived is one, an, an authentically African experience. The fact that my father came here uh, to train as a nurse and, uh, created me and then went back or I don't I don't I don't know I, I I'm sort of a stolen child I was given up to a trans translation adoption but then I wasn't because my mom was already white so it doesn't really count but it does mean my experiences are really peculiarly African to the UK um, so I can remember a, a, a young child still in primary school visiting a, a friend and all my friends would have been white. I was literally the only black in the village, except my brother, but he passed. He was half um, East, East Asian, uh, Indian, half Indian, um, and passed as white. And because he, we had a white family, there was nothing to attach him to, him to attach, whereas I was very visually not white. Um, I remember visiting a friend's house and her grandmother was there and I'd been taught, you know, you respect your elders. Um, and she went, I don't like black people, dear. Not you, and I, my eight-year-old brain logged, I'm the only black person you know, you S-T-U-P, you know, I swore at her inside my head, not outside. And then I lived with that, which was that basically I was raised deep within a white community, thinking that most of them were very stupid. And then I came, so I came out of quite a, a strongly sort of bigoted racist community into London and met amazing artists who were black and it was like oh right yeah 
black people are incredible. So it was a, it was a really weird. So though those stereotypes, I could always see a distance between them because my reality was so different. And that that is my personal black experience of the world and those stereotypes that they exist within misinformation and ignorance, but they are powerful and they do impact on people. And that my responsibility as an artist is actually just to celebrate my truth, which is, and I'm, I mean, one of the things I'm working with at the moment is how the hell are we such an incredible, loving, positive force on this planet still after everything we've received? And in doing that, how much that resilience has to offer the rest of the world at this moment. We're seeing the global rise of fascism. And if one thing we have to offer is how we're still human on the planet. I mean, I think it's this, I'd love this conversation to go somewhere else because when you were talking, Dyra, about being that um, that sort of conduit, there are times when my art making, when I literally, I'll look back and I, and I don't know that there is an absence of the conscious mind of me being the controller. I have just been somehow, I am producing something, there is a message through it, and I'm very aware of it, but I've been raised without the language, I have no community to connect and have that conversation with. I want to have those conversations. I think they're the anti-racist conversations that we can have as artists. And you know, my thing to the institution that's organized this, and thank you very much, is could you pay us the same money to have this conversation privately, please? And so we can really dig into some of those conversations, some of those nuances that are really difficult to have publicly. How to have a conversation about that, about that different way of being on the planet on, on, and that different way of receiving uh, knowledge and information and how it, it, you were saying that it's not attached to genetics. and. I only can have it attached to genetics because I was raised so isolated from my African root, but I know it's there. But it's a really difficult conversation to have publicly in the West, particularly within academia, because it's not recognized and it's seen as slightly mm. balmy. Mm. And I want to be able to have conversations that we value about our art making safely. Um, and we, and so I want there to be uh, in people. I want people in institutions who can create that and make this that sustainable. I want to know that I can talk to you, Liliana, and you, Daira, and you, Sawande. I know you live around the Rona, so uh, and you, Jamila, ongoing, so that we can explore the questions we want to ask each other. Because um, that's the other. It's like with with we're. we're we're constantly asked to ask questions that are of interest to the other. What are the qu so? I'm sorry, Peter. I don't mean I'm not pinpointing no, no, you, but, uh, <laughs> it, and that's the part of the problem. That's part of the stereotype is that we 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 have this great potential for each other, but also for the world. But we have these constraints that are, that are placed there on purpose. They're placed there on purpose. They people don't want us to share our resilience and our strength and our heart and our humanity because we are such a powerful force for change. And I want an institution to fund us to do that very thing. Mm. So that, that, that's my answer to the question around stereotype. Okay. So thank you for that. Very, very, can interesting. I, can I just, very interesting. Can I just jump in and, and say, in support of that's the space to talk, the founders of Black Arts Alliance, I wasn't a founder. One of the objectives, ah they wrote was we need space so we can look inwards. So we can look inwards. Oh, I can't remember the full quote now. So we can look inwards and debate. I'm going to put that in. So we can look outwards with clarity. We used to run two events. One was Dinner for 12, which was art form based. So, you know, it would all sculptures, maybe all fine art painters would come together and have dinner. The agenda was to talk. And then we used to have a different session called Let the Talking Commence, where we would have two guest speakers who would share their experience. The main reason I started to organize them is that there used to be an organization called the, Ameri the Association of American Cultures, obviously in America, um, that moved right across the continent. And I went to many events, amazing events, where we sat and gathered, where 
uh, the Native Americans of each area would host morning events, blessings, sunrise events. And what began to undermine the organisation, and it goes back to that thing of, you know, of skin tone and who is black and the misuse of the word Negro, or well, not the misuse because it's a bad word, but the use of the word Negro, is that it began to be infiltrated by Anglo-Americans, white Americans, who were saying things like, well, five back, uh, in, five back in my generation, um, there was a Native American grandfather or something. They were worried about that closed conversation and undermined the organization. As far as I know, it doesn't run anymore. They began to say things like, why are you talking with, uh, without us? What are you saying that you don't want us to hear? And in the end, we stopped going. We mm. need privacy. Men need time to talk on their own. Women need time to talk on their own. Everybody needs privacy. Mothers without their children. It's given respect to space. So I definitely support Echo saying that we do need that. But it doesn't have to be funded by the organisation, by the mainstream. We can do it independently. It would help though, wouldn't it? Then I can pay the bill to, to keep the electric on. <laughs> you want to be oh, fed and watered. I think, I think it's an I think it's a legitimate demand. That's the other reason that I do think you should stay with we work with an organization, is to take the money straightforwardly. Oh well, I, I, well, I, well, I, it's I, a I agree. Redistribution you know, of power get... is money. Diana, but what our sisters don't know, I mean Black Arts Alliance was once the largest network of black artists in the UK never never been financially in debt and yet they took our revenue off us hmm. they felt we were getting too powerful so they took it, they took it off us so but i've have always had said if there's a grant money there and you can get your hands on it take it it's what yeah. we paid our taxes for what our parents and our grandparents etc all the way back to africa contributed to so we've been going for two hours. I just want to let Diana see if um, we cut you off or you, we lost track of you in the middle of a, of a sentence. Did you, did you want to finish what you had, were saying at that point? Yeah, uh, well, I was just sharing the, the fact that uh, we, we deal with every the stupidity of racism. Uh, the best way I found is just celebrating who I am and my culture and my people and uh, uh, I don't have time to lose with stupid people, you know. Um, the, the, the misconceptions and prejudice about indigenous nations are so lame that uh, I prefer to use my energy on celebrating who we are and how wonderful we are uh, in our diversity, uh, in our history, identity, territories. And I dare anybody to talk to me about my own culture. And uh, I don't believe it's necessary to uh, be submitted to translation every time and um, together to understand us fully the same way we are not able to understand the stupidity of racism you know uh, but we must live and go on and celebrate the best we have and uh, so in my arts i just celebrate my culture uh, for the mo for the moment of course i work as an activist and i work with human rights in other spaces uh, larger than than the arts and uh, for me it's, everything is connected there are no really uh, walls that separate uh, the institutions or etc because in my culture the, there is no divisions uh, the, the the mainly difference between the western culture and the indigenous culture is the, that the western white culture is a is a culture of little boxes of putting peoples and thinkings and and languages and uh, and science and knowledge in little boxes and for us for me at least it's not true that is not my truth and i refuse to be um labeled uh with the truth of another with the truth of uh civilization shown so many stupidity just by the genocide that they have promoted in my territory in my people in my family and uh, so by reaffirming my space and, and my life, I am 
just trying to live and breathe and in, in, in this breath uh, share uh, what uh, I do believe and uh, how I believe we can value and restore uh, the energy of life that we deserve to have as human people, you know? Uh, the, the racism is so present that the indigenous population all over the world is the population that commits the most suicide, is the population that is the most victim of human traffic, uh, is, a, is very, uh, has a very, really present and violent disease of alcoholism and depression and etc. And uh, if I want to battle that, I need to value and show how we are intelligent, we are beautiful, we are powerful, and we have the right to occupy every space. And um, that's it. <laughs> okay, great. Well, that's a good place, I think, to, to wind up. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying about little boxes. We're all in little boxes at the moment on the screen. <laughs> Hopefully we've been able to get past the, uh, the barriers to some extent and get outside of our little boxes. Uh, in this conversation. So it's been very, very interesting. Thank you all very much for um, contributing your time to this event. I've certainly learned a lot about uh, how you people as artists um, relate to questions about racism and racial difference and so on. It's been very instructive for me and I hope for our, our audience as well. So I'd just like to say uh, thank you once again for your participation and uh, hopefully we can maybe keep this conversation going as you you would like to obviously do, uh, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing. So thank you again and um, goodbye. Have a good evening. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Lovely. Nice to meet you. Bye. 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 Blessings on everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>